So welcome back, everyone. Um, I see the numbers are dropping off a bit. Um, that's a pity because some of the more interesting uh, techniques we're covering here towards the end of the um, series. But um, anyway, this particular talk has um, special significance in that um, last year, uh, about 10 minutes before I was due to give this talk, I got a telephone call telling me that um, we were going into lockdown and I couldn't um, deliver the talk. So that was kind of approximately a year ago. So uh, at least we're making more progress this year than we did last year. So in this talk, I'm going to just go through a few aspects of um, light the light scattering techniques that are very commonly used in structural biology settings, such as at the LMB. So I'm going to cover basic theory of light scattering, talk mainly about static light scattering and its use in structural biology. I'm going to briefly mention dynamic light scattering and then at the very end just cover in, in a minute or so some other uses of scattering. So light scattering in general has a very good connection with um, Cambridge and in fact with the LMB in that the LMB uh, originated down at the um, Cavendish Labs in the centre of Cambridge and the first um, Cavendish professor of experimental physics was James Clark Maxwell and um, he developed a series of equations that um, describe um, electromagnetic radiation um, and in that um, in Maxwell's description um, if you consider um, uh, for example plain polarized light you have um, an electric field oscillation and a magnetic field um, oscillation, which is perpendicular to that. And the intensity of light that you might want to consider is proportional to the um, square of the amplitude of the electric field oscillations. And it's this interaction uh, of the electric field with matter that's going to be the major contributor to light scattering. So after Maxwell um, handed over the professorship of experimental physics, the second uh, professor was um, Lord Rayleigh, um, also John William Strutt. Um, and uh, Rayleigh was involved in um, determining why it was that um, um, electromagnetic radiation generated um, light scattering. And what he proposed was that um, the electric vector in electromagnetic radiation induces oscillating dipoles in matter where that matter is polarizable. So it has positive and negative charges that can be separated. So we've got a little movie here showing you how the incident electromagnetic radiation um, generates um, an oscillating dipole. These oscillating dipoles then re-emit light um, and because they're oscillating at the same frequency um, as the incident light then it's um, a form of elastic scattering um, and the wavelength is the same. This is so-called Rayleigh scattering or known as Rayleigh scattering. And um, so if you consider plain polarized light which is um, commonly used in light scattering techniques to simplify the situation then the scattering is predominantly in a plane which is perpendicular to that of the instant light. Now the intensity of scattering um, reflects how easy it is and how many of these polarizable dipoles there are within the system. Um, and this is also reflected in um, the, the increment or the, the way that the um, particle that you're studying affects refractive index. Um, so um, the intensity of scattering um, is reflecting this polarizability and this is proportional to the square of um, something that we know as the refractive index increment, which is basically how much the refractive index increases with um, some measure of concentration. Um, it's also um, interesting to note and has great significance in that the intensity of scattering um, in a particular regime, which I'll discuss in a minute, um, is proportional to reciprocal of wavelength, in this case raised to the power four. 
So if you consider um, what scattering might be useful for, one of the classic um, applications is to determine particle mass. Um, and within uh, a, a particle, particularly a biological macromolecule, there are going to be many, many dipoles in that particle. And they will, in general, um, emit light coher coherently, whereas when we're looking at light that's coming from another particle in solution, um, the light that's emitted is out of phase. So for co coherent in-phase light, we have um, the sum of the intensities squared. Um, whereas for the intensity of incoherent light, um, we've got the square of the sum. Uh, sorry, I've got that the wrong way around. Um, so where we have in-phase light, we have the square of the sum, which is the sum of all the um, 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 intensity of scattered light squared. And uh, for incoherent out-of-phase light, we have the sum of the individual intensities squared. Um, so for any given level of polarizability, the intensity of scattered light is going to scale with particle mass. Um, and in the case of static light scattering and also dynamic light scattering instrumentation that we have um, uses polarized laser light source and we measure the intensity or fluctuations for DLS of light that's perpendicular um, to the incident light. So here in this graph, you can see that if we consider um, a, a group of individual particles, the intensity of scattered light it's going to be fairly minimal, but if we clump all of these individual particles together into a single particle um, where we're in this regime where we retain coherence, um, then we're going to get a massively increased amount of scattered light. So when we're talking also about light scattering, another um, uh, property of particles that we can probe is their size. And that's because small particles tend to scatter light equally in all directions um, and they're so-called isotropic point scattering um, particles. But uh, eventually, as the particle size increases relative to the wavelength of light that we're using to probe the system, some of the coherence of the scattered light is lost from individual particles. And what we see is an increasing attenuation of the scattered intensity at angles above zero degrees. And this is due to um, intramolecular interference um, and a, a loss of coherence. So in here in this graphic, you can see for a small particle when we're considering light at 658 nanometers, this particle is around about three nanometers uh, in um, radius. Um, we see that all of the uh, different angles that I'm displaying here are giving the same intensity of scattering. But then when we consider a much larger particle, um, in this case, much larger than 10 nanometers, we can see the lowest angle gives the highest um, intensity of scattered light, whereas higher angles give a much reduced intensity. And this is due to this phenomenon and loss of um, coherence. So um, the full description of Maxwell's equations in, in the context of light scattering uh, was, was predominantly developed by um, me. And um, in his um, equations and solution to Maxwell's equations, um, this attenuation of scattering phase function um, is including the particle radius um, or size and the wavelength and the scattering angle. And it's very common in the field that um, the, um, when considering different particles, we refer to them with this size parameter, which is basically the circumference of the particle divided by the wavelength. And here you can see again that as we um, start to increase the particle size, so in this case, um, when x is about 1, the particle is about a fifth uh, in circumference, or sorry, the radius is about a fifth in circumference of the, um, of the wavelength. Um, sorry, I probably said that wrong. So when X is one, uh, the radius is about a fifth uh, uh, of the wavelength. The circumference is equal to the wavelength. We can see here then that we get a predominantly um, 
unequal distribution of scattered intensity um, away from um, zero angle. And um, by measuring and fitting this attenuation, we can determine a parameter that's known as the root mean square radius, also known in the literature as the radius uh, of gyration. So here you can see in this graphic that um, for this particular particle, which is about 20 nanometers and using 658 incident um, radiation, we see about a 5% attenuation um, between um, the scattering at a zero angle and that at 180 degrees. So what is the root mean square radius? Well, radius of gyration is also um, used for this term, but it's rather misleading. In, in the, this is no reference to a, a dynamic measurement on, on the particle. And the root mean square radius um, reflects the mass distribution around the center of the particle weighted by the square of the distance of these mass components from the center. Um, that's perhaps not so easy to visualize, but what is easier is if you think about a ping pong ball where all of the mass of the object is located equally from the center of mass, um, and it's also located on the outside of the particle, um, then in that case, um, for that hollow sphere, the radius of duration or the root mean square radius is, is the same as the physical radius. For a solid sphere, like a billiard ball or, or some other type of sphere, uh, such as a protein, then typically um, the uh, root mean square, uh, sorry, the, the physical radius um, is going to be larger than the uh, root mean square radius. That's because some of the mass is close to the center of mass, some is further away. And you can develop similar relations for um, random coils and for rigid um, rods. So this is potentially a soft structural uh, probe of your particle of interest. So me theory um, describes um, all scattering, but um, where we're in a regime where the um, particle size parameter is similar to the wavelength, the um, mathematics can be horrendously complex and very messy. But uh, at the extremes where particles are much smaller than the wavelength um, of electromagnetic radiation, or um, the particles are much larger, then due to the dominance of either the radius um, or the um, wavelength, then um, we can adopt much simpler approaches and the analysis becomes um, a lot more tractable, at least to people who are not um, physicists or specialists in this area. Unfortunately, most biological work that we might be interested in would be conducted using visible or near infrared lasers um, and particles are typically going to be somewhere between one and 15 um, nanometers in radius. And so we're predominantly in this Rayleigh scattering region between particle sizes of uh, 0.002 and 0.2. At the higher end where um, particles are much larger then me theory conduct, um, converges on uh, geometric um, optics and ray tracing. So having said then that we can kind of simplify the um, analysis of um, scattering here is the kind of equation that we will typically apply when we're analyzing um, data. So within this, we have a, a measured um, intensity of scattered light um, and at any particular angle that we want to measure. We then have here a bunch of um, so-called optical constants um, which include um, the polarizability factor, which is this DNDC, in this case squared, the refractive index of the solvents and the wavelength that we're using to interrogate the system. Here we have the molar mass, um, which is probably one of the parameters of interest that we're trying to determine, and the concentration, which we're measuring under. Here we have this P theta, which is the form factor, which is reflecting the 
um, angular term or the attenuation of light as a function of angle. And using um, a laser of 658 nanometers, you saw already that for a particle of 20 nanometers um, in radius, uh, we get about a 5% attenuation. So in general, particles need to be for this particular wavelength greater than 10 nanometers in radius. Otherwise, this particular form factor will be equivalent to one and the particle will be, appear as a isotropic point scatterer. And then finally here in this equation, we also have a term which uh, accounts for intermolecular interference in a, in a parameter known as the second virial coefficient. And I'll discuss that um, in a bit more depth um, later on. But typically this um, is also going to approximate um, to uh, one as this term here containing the second virial coefficient um, is very small. So light scattering in practice then in a structural biology setting. So what we have at the LMB um, is instrumentation from a company called Wire who are based in California. Um, and um, we have um, a series of um, instruments that are basically detectors that can measure either um, light scattering or refractive index. So we have a multi-angle light scattering instrument, which has a series of detectors arrayed between um, 22 and 150 degrees. And it uses this wavelength of 658 nanometers that I've mentioned several times. This allows us to measure the intensity of scattered light. We also have this instrument, which is a differential refractometer. And this would allow us to measure the polarizability of our substance of interest normally proteins. Um, and by to do this, we would measure the refractive index increment caused by a, generated by a known concentration of protein. In that um, this increment is a function of concentration, this means that we can um, also use the polarizability factor to determine the concentration. So the refractive index can also be used as a concentration um, detector. We can also use uh, other types of detectors for concentration measurement, such as uh, UV detectors, which um, uh, would, would be around um, using um, ordinary absorbance uh, measurements. So this differential refractive index, it turns out that um, the polarizability of proteins um, is pretty well universally constant. This reflects the fact that um, a lot of the polarizability comes in the, in the peptide backbone structure and the side chains are typically also, some are polarized and some are not polarizable. Um, and these are sort of fairly evenly distributed. So you can check out in this paper here where um, people generated the calculated, sorry, the refractive index increment for a large number of proteins in protein databases and found that the, um, district, the average was 0.19 uh, for a one gram per mil solution. And the distribution is fairly tight. So this is particularly useful in terms of determining concentration in that it allows us to measure concentration of proteins when there's no absorbance. So if there's no aromatics in your protein or you don't know the sequence of your protein or you have a complex with an unknown stoichiometry, you would not know what the UV extinction is of the complex. We can use refractive index with this universal DNDC. This value is reasonably large and DNA has a somewhat a similar value, although slightly smaller and other biological uh, macromolecules of interest also have um, reasonable DNDCs. So most biological particles of interest are quite polarizable and scatter light fairly well. Um, uh, one thing to point out is that this uh, 0.19 refractive index increment is for a one gram per mil solution. So typically we're working normally at mg per mil of protein or biological molecule. And so the change in refractive index that those 
that that component induces in the solvent is very very small typically 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 6 of a refractive index unit so we have to measure refractive index or the excess refractive index using a split um, uh, cell um, with as a differential measurement because the solvent or the water is giving us a refractive index of 1.3 and what we're trying to determine is on the order of 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 6 of that. So when we're thinking about measuring the um, intensity of scattered light, we have the problem that if we make a, a batch measurement, we've already seen that scattered intensity is very proportional to mass. And so um, a small number of large particles can significantly bias your measurement or your measured intensity to uh, significantly higher or apparently significantly higher masses. So if you want to measure the intensity of scattered light in a batch measurement mode, meaning you would just put the sample into the instrument and make the measurement, it must be highly monodispersed if possible uh, and pretty stable. So filtering may help with very fine um, filters but that um, kind of hides the possibility that there might be larger particles present. Um, and that might be one of the reasons that you're interested in making the measurement is to try and assess the quality or the dispersity of your, your protein preparation. So what would make the measurement much more suitable is to fractionate uh, materials prior to actually making the detection. And this is what we do in, in the technique that we use very heavily at the LMB. I would say it's probably one of the most popular techniques within the biophysics facility. This is so-called um, SEC MOLS, where we couple conventional size exclusion chromatography um, upstream of our detectors. So we would um, inject the sample, pass it through a column, the classical SEC experiment, particles get fractionated and then they pass through a series of detectors. Normally we collect the UV absorbance because that's part of the SEC uh, chromatography system. But, and then we also couple the uh, flow lines through to our light scattering detector and then finally through the refractive index detector. And potentially each, each point um, each time point in our SEC chromatogram can be used and analyzed to give the mass of our particles or the particles that are passing through the detectors and their radius of duration. So this is a typical data set that you might get from such an experiment and you can see um, what you might um, recognize normally as your UV signal here that you would see from a 280 measurement, for example. Here we have the light scattering um, detectors. Um, obviously, this is they're squeezed down to get everything on scale. Um, but um, you can see here that um, we have potentially up to 18 different angles um, in our instrument. We're measuring um, a chromatogram with each um, individual light scattering angle. And then here is the refractive in index um, signal in blue. You can see a couple of other things about this chromatogram. First of all, here we have a significant light scattering signal coming at the column void. When we look at the UV, UV signal of that, um, at that illusion, we can see that we can't actually detect a peak, a peak of any visible size compared to the illusion of the main component that we're running on the column. Um, uh, and this is reflecting the problem in batch measurement in that this um, intensity would be added onto this intensity and you can see it's almost equal in amplitude for, sorry, for a um, amount of protein that we can't actually detect. So the chromatography allows us to separate and study this very large aggregated material or large particulates separately from, in this case, the monomer of the protein and the dimer. And then over here, you can see that there's a large deviation in refractive index, and this is coming at the solvent front of the system. So in this case, this sample, which was uh, BSA, 
um, contains some other salts um, and storage can, um, additives like sodium azide, and these are fractionated out during the size exclusion. So the refractive index is extremely sensitive to changes in solvent. The analysis of the data that we would get from a typical SEC moles um, experiment um, is, is derived on um, some, um, on um, normally most um, analyses are attempting to linearize the system. And in this case, we can do this by plotting these optical constants constants K star, uh, which you saw in the master equation um, and concentration divided by the intensity at a particular angle. And then this is plotted out against sine squared theta over two, which is essentially angle. Um, the Y axis intercept at zero angle. So we have a series of angles here in this divide plot. We linearly fit these and extrapolate these to zero angle. And it's that intercept that we use to evaluate the intensity at zero angle, and that is used to derive the mass. Then the slope of this Debye plot is reflecting the attenuation of the um, scattered intensity as a function of angle. Um, and that can then be used to evaluate the radius of gyration where the particles are larger than 10 nanometers. So obviously, when we're thinking about our chromatogram, and you can see here in the UV signal, we've got a series of time, you know, um, we're collecting the data and integrating the signal for maybe a second or so. So we have huge number of points within this eluting peak. And this analysis can be performed at every single point in your chromatogram. So what you can end up with is a, a, a calculation of mass over some region of your chromatogram. This would be between um, these two time, the time points here and here. And if you zoomed in on this, what you would see is that every single time point within your chromatogram was able to yield um, a mass of the particles that were eluting um, at that particular time. So how do we then um, consider um, the masses that we've evaluated. Um, well, one way you can do that is to just do um, statistical averaging of the masses that you evaluate at each time point. And the most common methods are to do what you would imagine is a straightforward number average, um, which is just the sum of the <clears throat> number and the mass of the particles divided by the total number. But we can also calculate something um, called a weight average, where this equation then includes the mass of the particle. So here we have mass squared on the, on the top. Um, and you can um, have a look at this URL where this difference between number and weight average is explained um, in great, great detail. But you can see here very simply that if we have a highly polydispersed sample where all of our particles have a mass of two, um, then it doesn't really matter how we statistically average these masses, we end up with the same average number. Whereas here we have a polydispersed solution where we have particles of uh, between mass of one and four. Um, and here you can see that the um, number average and the weight average differ. So the ratio between the, the weight average and the number average is often quoted as an index of dispersity of our material. Um, here you can see um, a typical report from a chromatogram um, and this would re relate to a sample such as this, where we can see that the ratio between the weight and number average is very close to one, indicating a highly monodispersed sample. So as well as quoting these numbers, uh, which is the dispersity index, we can also just plot the data, as you've seen already, indicating the masses that we've evaluated, in this case, uh, the monomer, the dimer, and even the trimer of uh, BSA. And we can see that the mass is very constant across the peak. And this is also telling us that um, these materials are mono monodispersed. In the case of a polydispersed material, obviously, um, we would see mass distribution across the peak um, that um, was unequal and then the MW to MN ratio would not be 
uh, one. So I'm sure you're all sitting in uh, dreaming about uh, maybe holidays in the summer and obviously I, I'm sure everyone knows this. The reason why the sky is blue is because of um, Rayleigh scattering um, in that we have this inverse uh, wavelength dependence and the particles of gas and other um, atmospheric um, particles are very small relative to the wavelengths of visible light. Um, so because of this reciprocal of wavelength dependence, they scatter much more strongly um, at shorter wavelengths. So when we look at scattered light here, um, we see very blue um, or an, a blue enhanced color or a depletion of red. And when we look at transmitted light, in this case, the sunset, we're looking up directly at the sun, uh, we're seeing uh, red enhanced because the blue has been um, scattered away from us. So me scattering doesn't have any uh, wavelength dependence or at least in the me regime where particles are um, somewhat closer to the wavelength of light. And this explains why clouds are white um, in that they scatter all wavelengths uniformly or the, the uh, water droplets within particles, are, uh, sorry, within clouds are, are relatively close to the wavelength of light. So therefore explaining why clouds appear white, although obviously it's more common to see the LMB like this. In this case, um, the darkness in the clouds is um, not to do with scattering, but it's due to um, absorbance or the illumination at the base of the clouds is much lower than at the top, which is also why when you go in a plane and you go above the clouds, everything looks intensely white um, or the clouds look very white. So let's talk about some applications of light scattering, um, in particular SEC moles. Um, we've seen that we can evaluate mass in solution. And this is just to emphasize that we have a pretty accurate um, and very quick way of determining the mass. These runs take about um, 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and we have a very wide dynamic range over which we can determine masses. And a very important thing is that the mass is completely independent of the SEC elution volume. So we're not using standards or any sort of calibration to determine what our mass is. Here you can see um, that the mass um, is very close to the expected mass um, in both of these cases. If you want to, to hear why it would be inappropriate to um, quote these masses with one decimal place, you should come along to the talk that Stephen and I give on um, errors, um, which is coming up shortly. Um, we can also apply um, um, the technique um, to work over many, many or universally over all proteins. We don't need to know uh, concentration before we make the run. We don't need to have any UV absorbance so we can work without aromatic residues. We don't need to know um, what um, kind of stoichiometry we have in a complex because we're going to use an extinction coefficient, which is universal to all proteins. We can even work with slightly less than 100% pure samples because we have an SEC step. So obviously we're assuming then that the contaminants are fractionated away during the SEC. And here you can see also, you can even work with GFP tagged proteins where we're here able to determine the um, masses of some of these uh, materials being GFP tagged, determine them very accurately. That's because the laser is working in, um, in the red region of the or longer of the spectrum. Uh, we've already seen that the uh, technique is highly sensitive to low levels of high mass material. And that, that in observation in itself, which you cannot detect by either the refractive index or the UV signals shown here in green and blue. There's no apparent peak here, but it's very easy to see when looking at the light scattering that we have very, um, um, well, we have some amounts of material there. And that may be interesting in terms of solution optimization for crystallography or for cryo EM, for example. We can also start to look at tight binding and complex um, formation. 
Um, so where the sample concentrations are above the KD of a complex forming during the SEC, then we're going to get a stable complex which will run. Um, and here you can see an example of two proteins um, in, the, in the 10 kilodalton range or so. Um, and interestingly enough, this one here, Barnes in blue, runs very anomalously. Um, and these are where the standards would run on this particular SEC system. So again, you can see you determine the mass very accurately. There's no reliance on the elution volume. And in fact, if you did use the elution volume, you would get the wrong mass. You can see here when you mix them together, you get a one-to-one -one complex. Here's another example where uh, we're looking at tight binding and we're able to stably form um, a complex between this particular antibody fragment and this particular trimer here. And, and again, get very good agreement in terms of masses um, and the expected um, molecular model. So for weaker interactions, by this I mean that when we're running the SEC, the sample concentration will vary through the KD as we pass through the peak. Um, there are um, also uh, complications to this kind of um, um, interpretation in that there's obviously a kinetic limitation in that we want to see the equilibria um, come to completion. And if the kinetics are um, quite slow, then we may be viewing the system um, in the tight binding mode. But in this case, with fairly rapid kinetics, what we see is the mass distribution across this peak um, varies as the concentration of the protein um, um, varies from here low to high. And in this case, this was a coiled coil system. Um, and we can see that the monomer mass, um, so at this concentration, um, then the, the, we're achieving almost completely monomer. Um, and as we increase the concentration on this, during the measurement, we drive the system towards dimer formation. So we don't necessarily always look at proteins. We can definitely measure many other types of biological macromolecule. And one of um, um, one element or one, one system of interest might be um, studying detergents. Here you can see, um, looking at the UDM detergent, what we've done here is equilibrate the SEC system with a buffer that contains um, UDM above its CMC, which is about 0.03%. And then by making injections of UDM, which are more concentrated again than the CMC, so half percent, two percent, and five percent, we see an excess of detergent micelles come down the column and we can detect those with light scattering and in this case refractive index to determine uh, their mass and their um, um, radius. Um, in this case we're determining hydrodynamic radius and I'll come on to explain how we do that with SEC moles um, in a minute. Um, but you can see that we can accurately determine the um, um, the, the, we obtain the same mass because obviously the detergent forms a, a fixed um, micelle, has the same radius and the same mass. Where the use of this might be is that if you're concentrating proteins in the presence of detergent um, for crystallography, for example, you may not know how much detergent you have in the solution. So it's a convenient way of determining the excess amounts of detergent. We also have another application of SEC molds, which is very useful and very powerful. That's because we have potentially two signals that can be used to determine concentration. That's the refractive index and the UV signal. Um, if we analyze um, a simple system, which is just pure protein, for example, using either refractive index or UV, we should obtain the mass, uh, the same mass from either concentration source subject to unknowns and any errors of measurement. Um, we would obtain the same mass with either signal. But in cases where we have mixed systems where proteins are modified, for example, they might be glycosylated um, or pegylated, or they're forming um, a complex with protein detergent, then what we have in that complex is an apparent extinction coefficient for either RI or UV which is a reflection of the weighted sum of the 
of the components of the complex. But using a, a method known as conjugate analysis, <clears throat> we can determine ind independently the mass of the protein and the modifier, uh, which could be the carbohydrate or it could be the detergent. And we can determine um, then the mass of the whole complex altogether. To, to do this, we need to know the D, the refractive index increment of both the protein, which we already know is 0 0.19, but also the modifier. Um, and these are fairly well tabulated in the literature. We also need to know the extinction coefficient for UV absorbance for again for the protein and the modifier. And we get the best accuracy with this method where the values differ by large amounts. And that's particularly um, convenient for glycosylation because glycosylation, um, the carbohydrate modifier doesn't have any UV absorbance at all. So here you can see an example of a conjugate analysis. Um, in this case, um, the black line shows um, SEC standards that were run on this particular column. And when this protein, which has a sequence uh, molecular weight of about 46 kilodaltons, um, it um, was run on this particular system, there were two peaks obtained that came round about 200 kilodaltons and round about 500 kilodaltons. So we ran the uh, smaller of these two peaks and SEC molds indicated that this had a mass of around about 60 kilodaltons. Here you can see two runs where we're evaluating the mass of this um, particular uh, fraction from the initial SEC. So despite the fact that it looks like it's much larger than it is, um, we obtain a, a mass around about 60 kilodaltons. But 60 kilodalton mass is still um, not um, significantly close to the expected sequence of the monomer, which is 46 kilodaltons. Um, and so the protein definitely has a larger hydrodynamic properties than we would expect. And this is why it's eluting here close to 200 kilodalton standard. However, the protein was known to have glycosylation sites and, and the preparation had been expressed in, in a eukaryotic vector. So using this form of conjugate analysis, we were able here to determine um, the mass of the protein component. And here's the level of 46 kilodalton that we expected. Here is the mass of the modifier, which is the glycosylation. And here's the total mass, which came out to be about 65 kilodaltons. All of these agreed very well with the potential modification and the number of sites within the protein. Here's another analysis, uh, sorry, here's another example of conjugate analysis, where in this case, we were determining um, the mass of um, a hexameric complex, which should have been about 170 kilodaltons. Um, and we were able to determine that with reasonable accuracy. Um, and um, the modifier in this case was the detergent digitonin. So the observed mass was up around about 550 kilodaltons, um, but of that, the majority of that was um, detergent, which was conjugated to the protein. Okay, so earlier on, we had a look at the um, equation that describes light scattering as a function of angle, concentration, polarizability. And there was also this uh, property of the second virial um, coefficient, which is this A2 term. And what the second virial coefficient is, is an expansion of osmotic pressure with respect to pro, um, protein concentration. Um, that's not particularly easy to visualize or conceptualize, but if, if A2 or the second virial is a positive number, this reflects the fact that proteins prefer to interact with the solvent rather than other protein molecules and vice versa for a negative value of second virial. So second virial coefficient has been proposed as an index of um, where you might be able to obtain um, reasonable crystals if you're doing crystallography. Um, so under conditions where second virial coefficient is negative, proteins prefer to interact with each other rather than with um, solvent. 
you can easily measure the second virial coefficient by doing a concentration dependence of scattering and doing something known as a zim plot, which is effectively a kind of three dimensional um, divide plot where you have angle here, intensity of scattering, and then these are a series of concentrations. Um, I've already mentioned this once, but in reality, if we look at the uh, values of second virial coefficient, in this case here is in, um, a series of measurements on PSA under the various different solution conditions. And if we take a value of about one times 10 to the minus four, um, for the second virial and a concentration around about 0.1 mg per mil, which might be the concentration that we have on an SCC column during a run when we inject it at one mg per mil, and the mass is say around about 50 kilodaltons, then this second virial term, this whole term here becomes equal to about 0 0.001. And so in fact, this approximates to one. So normally we don't need to worry too much, uh, relatively low, concentrations of sampled material, um, but we need to just be aware of it and where we're wanting to run samples, for example, at very high concentrations, which is something that's done um, with uh, therapeutic antibodies where they're injected at nearly 100 mix per mil, then we obviously need to take that into account during our analysis. So I'll just talk now about dynamic light scattering in the last um, five to 10 minutes. And um, one of the um, things about um, dynamic light scattering is we're looking at fluctuations in um, scattering intensity. And I covered this in some detail during um, the talk uh, that I gave about single molecule spectroscopy, where a technique um, known as fluctuation correlation spectroscopy is essentially analyzing the data in the same way using autocorrelation analysis. So these particles diffusing within our solution causes fluctuations in uh, um, something known as the speckle pattern of the laser. Um, and whereas when we're measuring S, uh, conventional static light scattering, we're averaging these fluctuations out um, during dynamic light scattering, we're looking at the frequency of these fluctuations, giving us information about particle size, or more importantly, information about diffusional properties. Diffusion is what we're measuring. So in the talk on single molecule, I went through how you analyze these fluctuations in terms of autocorrelation. So I won't dwell on that, but what you end up with is correlation function, which decays from a high level of correlation to zero correlation. And this can be used to determine the translational diffusion coefficient of our particles. And if we then take the translational diffusion coefficient and input that to the Stokes-Einstein equation, which includes the solvent viscosity, Boltzmann and temperature, um, then we can extract the hydrodynamic radius of our particle. The hydrodynamic radius is equivalent to the radius of a sphere that would diffuse with the same translational diffusion coefficient as um, our particle. What it does not mean is that the particle is a sphere and it is definitely not a physical dimension of the particle. It's a property that's reflecting how that particle diffuses. So how do you measure it? Well, you, again, you can measure um, dynamic light scattering in a batch measurement mode. So these types of um, instrument that we have here in the LMB or these two on the left use a cuvette or a method of holding some volume of solution in a laser beam where you can measure. In this case, we also have this instrument which uses um, conventional microtiter plates either 96 or 384 well plates. And all of these techniques or the, all of these, sorry, this instrumentation measures in a batch method mode. Um, again, we have the same problem that we had with static light scattering, that batch methods are going to be very, very sensitive to small amounts of large particles, which scatter light extremely efficiently. And the analysis of autocorrelation um, 
to determine translational diffusions um, is extremely complicated um, and somewhat of a minefield in batch measurement of DLS. So you'll see that there are different, you may have heard or know about different types of ways of analyzing the um, autocorrelation decays, cumulants and regularization methods. Um, and one should be very careful when um, making these measurements not to overinterpret um, the results from batch measurement. What is more productive and what we have also at the LMB is that you can um, introduce a, a dynamic light scattering detector into your static light scattering instrument by replacing one of the detector static light scattering detector angles. Um, and then by doing that in an SEC moles mode, you're coupling your dynamic light scattering measurement to um, um, the SEC fractionation. So again, here you can see the dynamic light scattering is shown in pink, and you can see that you have a significant dynamic light scattering contribution here at the column void, but this is what we're interested in. And when we analyze the autocorrelation of particles that are looting here in the chromatogram, we get a very nice autocorrelation function that can be fit very cleanly to give the uh, translational diffusion coefficient and therefore the hydrodynamic radius. So what would we want to do with a hydrodynamic radius? Um, well, one of the questions that we found is quite um, useful is just to ask, is this value typical for a globular protein? Here you can see a plot where um, there's a theoretical uh, line shown in red, which is what we expect for native so-called globular spherical-like proteins. Obviously, proteins are not spheres, but um, we can model um, what we might expect for native proteins. And if we measure many, many native proteins here shown in red, we find that actually the values of hydrodynamic radius that we measure do fall fairly well on this line, particularly in smaller sizes. So here we studied the P53 protein. Um, and in this case, this is um, a, a tetramer, which is held together by this domain here. And it has various regions of linkers. It has a core domain that interacts with DNA and um, a um, unstructured N-terminal domain that's used to, um, is modified during um, various types of cell signaling. And when we look at the different components of this P53 system, we can see when we look at the folded tetramization domain, it lies very close on this native, um, um, sorry, native um, protein, um, distribution here. And when we look at the unstructured N-terminal domain here, we can see this lies very close to a line that we can get by studying denatured proteins shown here in blue. So this is a way, if you like, of looking at the mass of the particle, the, the known size and saying, is this RH typical for what we expect for a globular protein? And then as you start to add bits of the protein together, you find that for larger bits, for example, tetramization domain, and then this linker region here, then the, the protein has a hydrodynamic radius, which is neither native or unfolded. And that extends as you make the protein larger and larger. Another thing you can do <clears throat> is just, you might want to know what the hydrodynamic radius is um, for other types of measurement, and that might be verifying other types of spectroscopy, such as single molecule measurement. <clears throat> and also what's quite interesting is to compare your hydrodynamic radius with the radius of gyration, which could be calculated from the structure or measured by moles, but only measured where the radius of gyration is larger than 10 nanometers or so. And you find that for compact spheres, you have a very established ratio of radius of duration over hydrodynamic radius of about 0.77. So the hydrodynamic radius, which is the radius of the diffusion of the particle, is always larger, or for a compact globule, is always larger 
than the radius of duration, which is reflecting the mass distribution around the radius. But of course, here you can see <clears throat> that these radii do not really correlate particularly well with the overall dimensions of the protein, as proteins are not perfect spheres. So here's an example of how that proved to be useful. We were studying this particular system here, which is um, part of the centriole. Um, and this has a head-to-head -head domain, which interacts with other um, um, proteins of this type and forms the circular centriole um, structure. And this then has coil-to-coil -coil domain, which extends out here. In this case, when we were looking at a longer construct, here where there was much more of the coiled coil domain. This is a crystal structure of this shortened construct ending at residue 179. When we looked at the full fuller length construct out to 326, we found that the radius of duration was around about just at almost at a point of measurement, about nine nanometers, whereas the hydrodynamic radius was about five nanometers. So this is an inverse to what we would expect for a compact globule in that this so-called um, um, shape factor or this R ratio of the two radii was about one and a half. And then when you look at this in terms of theoretical considerations, this value was very consistent with a, an extended rod-like shape in solution. So finally, in the last two minutes, I'll just talk about um, some other ways that you might think about using light scattering to improve your science in a more general context. As well here is determining whether you should use a buffer. Um, in this case, you wouldn't want to use this buffer. As you can see, it's, there's definitely scattering. So there are particles in this buffer, but not in, in this one. Um, one of the things that, um, scattering also does um, or, or has an effect on is that it, in, when you're measuring absorbance, the scattering will lead to a reduction in transmitted light. So when we're trying to make a simple absorbance measurement, um, then some of the light is scattered um, away from our detection um, position, which is over here in, in absorbance mode uh, or transmittance. And you can see that um, for Rayleigh scattering, you have a, a reciprocal wavelength um, to the power four dependence. There's another type of scattering, Tyndall scattering, that has dependence to power of two. So in either type of scattering, you can see that um, both of them are going to be, in particular, um, going to influence a measurement. So this is in fact how when we make a measurement to determine how well our bacteria have grown, we're looking at the scattering of the, of the bacteria um, in our solution. So when we measure at 600 nanometers, we're reliant on the bacteria being larger than the wavelength that we're using to interrogate them. But the important thing is that we often measure at 280 nanometers to determine how much protein we've got. And we can see here that scattering is going to contribute a large, um, or is potentially going to contribute a large um, amount of the uh, apparent absorbance in, in because of this reciprocal wavelength to the power four. So it's, it's important that when you're trying to very accurately quantify your protein concentration, that you have a look at scattering. And if there is scattering, you would correct your absorbance measurement for that scattering contribution. How do you do that? You simply measure the protein absorbance spectrum. So you want to measure out to say five or 600 nanometers, and that then includes wavelengths which are above 320 nanometers. Whereas here you can see that the um, aromatic, uh, sorry, the uh, amino acid side chains that contribute to absorbance at 280 nanometers do not um, absorb above 320 nanometers. So the prediction for a protein is there's zero absorbance above 320. Because the scatter um, is proportional to reciprocal of wavelength raised to some power, if we then plot out absorbance on a logarithmic scale, 
uh, we can then linearly extrapolate from this scattering regime above 320 nanometers into the regime where we're trying to measure the contribution from our aromatic residues. So what you do is just correct the observed absorbance reading for this uh, linearly extrapolated value. As you can see here, it's a, a very small amount and it should be less than one or two percent or so for a typical protein solution. Um, obviously, it may depend on how dirty your buffers are, uh, but it may also depend on um, how your protein itself is behaving in terms of its uh, potential to aggregate. So the corrected value is then the true protein uh, can be used with the extinction coefficient to determine the true protein concentration. And finally, just to mention um, that scattering is uh, obviously very sensitive to the formation of high mass particles. So it's quite a, quite a useful kinetic method to look at biological processes such as polymerization. Um, scattering can be very easily measured at 90 degrees using conventional fluorimeter or um, in other types of kinetic instruments such as a stop flow. I'll just show you here some polymerization kinetics, which are just looking at the intensity of scattered light um, as a function of time. And in this case, in this system, two proteins interacted, leading to very rapid polymerization of this system, generating large amounts of scattered light. Um, and protein, uh, if you just had one protein alone, the polymerization was a much, much slower. You could then um, initiate more rapid polymerization by adding B at a later point, and various mutants were made of this system to uh, probe the overall polymerization kinetics. So that's uh, the end of the talk. And um, just to mention that we shouldn't forget other types of scattering that we've covered during the biophysical um, techniques lectures, such as interferometric um, scattering or mass photometry or iScat, which I covered during talk six in that it's predominantly a single particle type of measurement. Um, there's also small angle X-ray scattering that you can perform at synchrotron sources. And of course, X-ray um, crystallography and diffraction is a, a form of scattering of um, electromagnetic radiation as well. So thank you for listening. If you type any questions you have in the Q&A, I will try and address those. And I'll just leave this up, which is a summary of what I've covered during the talk. While you type your questions, you can also have a look at that. Um, so Catherine is asking, what, what are the largest object dimensions you use? Um, in SEC moles, do you look at liposomes, for example? Um, obviously, um, the SEC is used to fractionate material um, upstream of your measurement detectors, um, and that removes the polydispersity that you might have in your sample. So, um, I'm not sure whether liposomes uh, will go down um, SEC or there may be some particular chromatography media that could be used. Um, or alternatively, um, we've certainly done um, work with vesicles um, that have been made um, and used to dynamic light scattering. And in that, in that case, if you've freshly prepared these vesicles, they tend to be very monodisperse. And the analysis by DLS is a, a lot more productive. Um, so I would say um, it's certainly possible to um, study liposomes. Um, we would maybe have a look at them by DLS first and um, see how big they are and possibly get an indication of how polydispersed they are. And then if they are highly polydispersed, then we would need to look for a fractionation method um, that might um, 
allow them to be uh, separated out. We do have in the building, <clears throat> although it's not in a functional mode at the moment, another technique called field flow fractionation, which doesn't use a chromatography matrix. It relies on um, fluid dynamics within a, within a chamber. So if you want to find out more about that, um, I can talk to you about that um, later if you drop me an email. Um, but I would suggest that DLS would be the, the, the route into that, that problem. Uh, when I quantify proteins at 280, I correct subtraction by the absorbance at 340. Is the, that all right? Yes. Um, so at any wavelength above 320 nanometers, um, uh, sorry. If you look at this plot here, you'll see that this is um, on a logarithmic scale. So here at 320 nanometers, these, these absorbance values are essentially absolutely zero <clears throat> compared to the value. This is a molar extinction coefficient some sort of logarithmic uh, representation. So um, indeed, how you, there is um, a um, formula that you can use, which I can't remember off the top of my head, but it relies on a single point measurement at a wavelength round about 340. And then you just correct the amount of absorbance at 340 um, for the observed value at 280. I can't remember the exact formula. Are you in, uh, if you drop me an email, I'll send you the uh, formula for that. Um, I think it's at three, 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 three nanometers. The problem with just measuring at one single wavelength is you don't know how that dependence varies. Um, the advantage of collecting the whole spectrum is basically you've got a series of wavelengths and because of the reciprocal wavelength to the power, the logarithm of that should be linear, and then you can just fit that to a straight line. And that allows you to extrapolate more accurately under the region where your protein is genuinely absorbing. Um, so if you drop me an email, I'll forward you the formula for the single point correction. Okay, any more questions? If not, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thanks for the questions. And um, hope to see you on Thursday when we're going through flow cytometry. <clears throat>